Hey everybody, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching. All right, I kind of put myself out there last week. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for another confession from your pastor. All the ex-Catholics are like, aren't we supposed to confess to you? I'm not sure I like this reverse confessional, but um, I want you to know that I know Jesus. I love Jesus. I, I faithfully follow Jesus. But I still battle with feelings, sometimes overwhelming feelings of anxiety. I, I wish that weren't the case. I wish I could speak to this issue as someone who has complete victory over it, but I don't. And once again, I know anecdotally that that's a real issue for many of you here. I know this because many of you have shared it with me. I know it because I can sense it. I know it because culturally speaking, um, there's hard data suggesting that the feelings of anxiety have never been more pervasive I don't know what it looks like for you. Sometimes I'll find myself unable to sleep two o'clock in the morning. The weight of other people's problems, of my problems, of my family's problems, the things I I have to do. I'll find myself just trying to catch my breath, calm my spirit. And uh, I wish knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, following Jesus meant I didn't experience these things. But even... As a pastor, the battle is real. And I know, I know many of you relate, especially in these last two years, right? The last two years have been the longest 10 years of my life, I'd say. Uh, a, a, a mysterious virus that spreads like wildfire, that shuts down the entire world, disrupts everything that we've known as normal. And now add to that massive economic uncertainty, um, inflation, a war that is starting to look close to World War III, uh, a real estate market that you have been priced out of. There's racial tension. There's political tension. And you're not sure if what you're reading is true or some conspiracy theory. People throwing gravel at the prime minister and occupying our capital and, and many feeling legitimate encroachment from our government and wondering if Canada is fundamentally changing for the worse. It's no wonder people feel anxious and lonely and unsettled. In fact, um, I read an interesting statistic. I don't, I don't know the, the, the most up-to-date numbers, but according to the National Center for Health, this is an American agency, but I think we can easily connect the dots for us. And it contrasted the emotional state of people in July of 2019 compared to people in July of 2020 after the world changed forever. What difference would one year make? Well, according to the study in July of 2018, 8.2% of adults showed signs of anxiety disorder, 8.2%. Fast forward one year, and in July of 2020, 36% of adults showed signs of an anxiety disorder. Somebody's saying right now, this is a weird and depressing Mother Day's message. Um, (laughs) What happened to the Proverbs 31 woman? We don't usually adjust our our preaching based on, you know, the Hallmark holidays, but I, I do actually think this is pertinent for women. Overall, statistically, women were twice as likely to experience a major depressive anxiety disorder than men. Not surprisingly, and this has been reported by many other outlets, that the COVID working shift from home back to work, 
sometimes back to home, back to work, has been significantly harder on moms. And generally, they have less time for reflection and self-care. And I know this may not characterize all women, but we are seeing the pressure these days to be a lady boss at work, to be a mama bear at home, to be an attentive spouse, to uh, feeling the pressures of wanting to be an old school homemaker and a new school provider, contributor. Man, the pressure on women today. We're in this series called That Sinking Feeling. We're looking at some of the difficult emotions that are expressed in the Bible, most of which Jesus himself experienced at some point. And so today, as we look at anxiety, I I, want to just start by acknowledging that anxiety is very complicated, okay? Anxiety can be physiological. uh, It can be emotional. It can be circumstantial. It most definitely can be spiritual. And so when we talk about anxiety, I hope we can have a holistic approach to it, meaning that if you, uh, you maybe want to see your doctor who might help you with dietary things or give you supplements or give you medicine that might be helpful. Um, I'm a big proponent of professional counseling, ideally with someone who has a Christian worldview. We, we want to take a holistic approach. The only area I'm even a little bit qualified to talk about is, is the spiritual. And, and I don't feel all that qualified lately, if I'm being honest. So this is an issue that deserves more time, more expertise. I'm hoping that even this kind of tip of the iceberg talk would be helpful to someone who is struggling today. Did you know that Jesus dealt with anxiety? Um, And if Jesus was sinless, it must mean that feeling anxious in and of itself is not sinful. Jesus faced anxiety in a more severe way than we could ever imagine. Um, Anxiety, I suppose, is a little bit like anger. Anger in and of itself is not necessarily a sin, though anger can lead to sin. In your anger, the Bible says, do not sin. I suppose in the same way we could say, in your anxiety, do not sin. In your hurt, do not sin. In your sadness, do not sin. It can lead to sin. It doesn't have to. Um, Anxiety doesn't mean you've let God down. Jesus faced extraordinary anxiety as he realized what he was about to endure, as he looked ahead to the suffering, the the price he would pay on this torture device called a cross. And what's interesting, whenever Jesus felt anxious, you know what he did? He did what my smart wife does. He started talking. I go inward. Uh, Vicky starts talking about it, which I think is more helpful. Whenever anxiety rose up, Jesus talked back. And I want to show you three different places in the life of Jesus, three different ways to talk back to anxiety. Um, How you find relief from anxiety. The first thing we see Jesus do is something you may want to do. Number one, talk to your friends. Whenever you're feeling overwhelmed, Um, whenever you're feeling anxious, whenever you're feeling heaviness or a weight, it's so good to talk to godly, wise, spiritual friends. Mark 14, he says, well, this was the last supper and he was um, with his small group. Yeah, small group. That's what it was. It was his disciples. Yes, but it was also his closest friends. And Judas, one of the 12, slipped away to go betray Jesus. If anybody like me has had a Judas in your life, you, somebody who thought was a friend who turned out to be a betrayer, you can resonate with Jesus. You know the hurt, the anxiety that would cause. And then Jesus went with three buddies to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And Gethsemane means crushing. 
And so Jesus started talking to his friends and he said to his disciples in Mark, sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter, James, and John, the three of them along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. The son of God, Jesus, who was perfect, who never sinned, was deeply troubled and, and distressed. I like the way the message, which is a, it's a more poetic devotional translation. It puts verse 33 like this. It says of Jesus, he plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. I wonder how many of you could relate to being in a place like that recently. It's just a sinkhole of the heart. It's hard to catch your breath. It, It feels like darkness and panic is all around you. Jesus sank into this dark hole of dreadful agony. How come? Well, he knew the horror of what was about to come in in a few short hours. Even though he was completely innocent, even though he was God incarnate, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, he was going to be arrested then tortured and die by crucifixion, the most painful, the most humiliating way to die. Even worse, Jesus was sinless and he was about to become sin um, as the sacrifice for sins. So if you can imagine, he's always enjoyed perfect fellowship with his father who despises sin. And here Jesus was going to become Name it, rape, abuse, hatred, violence, racism, envy, lying, lust. He was going to become that. Holiness becomes filthiness. The one who never sinned became sin. And because of it, his father, who he loved, who he always walked with, had to turn away because of the holiness of God. He couldn't look upon that. And Jesus would cry out perhaps the most painful of all suffering. My God, my father, daddy, where are you? Why did you have to turn away? Why have you forsaken me? And in the middle of that kind of sinkhole, just watch the honesty that Jesus has with his friends. You know, uh, nobody lies like Christians. (laughs) We have our own F word. It's called fine. How are you doing? Oh, fine. Liar. No, really, how are you doing? Oh, uh, keeping on, keeping on. No, like, like really, uh, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Sure, 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 sure. But here's Jesus with just raw, complete transparency. He says, guys, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I ache so much inside. I don't, I don't know if I could survive it. Jesus said, would you please stay here? Keep watch. I need you more than, than I can even describe. He talked to his friends. And I believe one of the biggest reasons that so many people are battling anxiety today is because they're lacking community. You're, you're vulnerable to whatever the latest rumor of bad news is in part because you're lacking godly, encouraging, uplifting community from the body of Christ. And I'm guessing it's going to take years of study to look back on this season just to get an accurate picture of of what quarantine isolation has done to the emotional psyche of a whole generation. It's probably too soon to analyze it. If you're going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, in the very opening story, God says, it ain't good to be isolated. It's it's not good to be disconnected. God says, it's not good to be alone. In fact, who is Jesus? He is God with us. Emmanuel. In other words, God didn't just shout his love from heaven. He, he, He showed his love. by by coming to earth to be with us. It's the power of with. It's the power of one anothering, the body of Christ. It's why I've I've seen people who've come back 
to church after months of isolation. And when they walked in the building, they were surprised by the, the emotions that welled up. They'd say, I, I, I forgot how much I missed being with God's people. You weren't created to be alone. And social media is not an acceptable substitute either. Jesus, the, the sinless son of God, says to his friends, I need you. This is crushing me. I don't know if I can make it through this. Would you guys just sit close to me? Will you pray for me? My soul is overwhelmed. How many of you know sometimes the best thing you can do for someone is just sit with them? The gift of presence. You don't have words. Any words you may have would just feel like a cliche, but you put your arm around them. You remind them that you're there, that you're praying. What a beautiful gift that is. You know, different people at NAC have, have reached out, been very kind to me in what has been a low season. And I'm, I'm so grateful for them. Even when it's hard to talk about, hard to answer the phone. I, I won't tell you all the ways that, that love has been shown, but I'll embarrass one person. Uh, before I shared my semi-confessional talk on emotions, Frank, who had, had such a wonderful baptism testimony a few weeks ago, asked me before the service how I was. And I had decided I wasn't going to use the Christian F word anymore. And I was just going to tell him briefly, yeah, I'm struggling. And I was about to share a little history of my, my battle over the years. And he said, can I just stop you for a, a second? I just, I just want to say this. Will you please, please call me if you're ever feeling like that so you're not alone? The church could learn a thing or two from AA, from NA, from what they call the program. Ernest uh, Kurtz is a historian of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and he says, what unites addicts? What makes it possible from one addict to learn from another is that the foundation they share is not out of a strength, but a weakness. Each know that he or she cannot do it alone. You know, sometimes the church has a tendency to say something like, aren't you done with that issue yet? At AA, they never say that. They don't say, aren't you finished with that alcoholism yet? They say something like, keep coming back. We're so glad that you can make it. May the church learn from that. And so for Frank and for Keith and for Mike and Mai and Sherry and others, thank, thank you. If you're feeling anxiety, the first thing you can do is you can do what Jesus did. Bring others, bring trustworthy friends into that circle. Second thing you can do is talk to your heavenly father. Do you, do you get a little nervous when that red light on your car dash comes up? Um, does it create anxiety in you? It sure does in me. Uh, you get that little exclamation point, which I've just recently found out means your tires are low. Or... You get the check engine light, and I'm like, okay, I checked it. It's still there. Now, now what? Um, what I'd like to do is put some black electrical tape over the, the red flashing light. Um, I just don't want to see it. But the red light isn't the problem, is it? The red light is just the messenger. It's just a signal that there's something wrong. And you better take your car in. And I wonder if anxiety is like the warning light alerting you that it's time. It's time to pray. It's time to take what's on your mind to God. In fact, Paul wrote this to the Philippian church. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition, you take your request to God in everything you pray. In every situation, pray. In other words, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough 
to pray about. Oh, we just dedicated her, Lisa. I thought she, it would... Sorry. <laughs> I thought it would fix all crying afterwards. What's on your mind, you can take it to God. And if you're worried about your marriage, pray about your marriage. If you're worried about Ukraine, pray about Ukraine. If you're worried about the economy, pray about the economy. If you're worried about your job, if you're worried about your kids, pray for your kids. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Anxiety might might just be that, that warning signal that it's time to pray. And so Jesus talked to his friends, but he also talked to his heavenly father. We see it in verse 35. It says, going a little further, he fell to the ground. He just, he just cried out to God and prayed that if it's possible that this hour might pass, if there's any other way to do this, God, could we please do it that way? And he says, Abba, Father, which means Daddy God, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Here's what I love about Jesus' prayer. It is just honest. It wasn't like memorized. In fact, you know, if all we did was teach our kids memorized prayer, I think we're making a mistake. We're not really teaching them how to pray. And just as a side note, who came up with some of these kids' prayers? Some of your first prayers were a terrifying prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I (laughs) would... Who came up with that prayer for a (laughs) four-year-old? If you die tonight, honey, pray that the Lord takes your soul. Hope it's not the other side that takes... (laughs) All righty, nighty night, sweet dreams. Um, Who thought that was a good idea? You put that Metallica song with it as well, and you've really got yourself a horror movie. Jesus doesn't just pray some God is great, God is good, whatever, whatever prayer. He, he cries from the depths of his soul, and that's what God invites you to do. Peter says, cast your cares upon him. Just let him have it because God cares for you. You might just cry out to God. You might not even have the words except some, some guttural scream of frustration. But even when we don't know the words to pray, the Bible says that the spirit intercedes groaning. He interprets the groaning on our behalf. You know, what we often say, all we can say sometimes is, ah! And the spirit says, Father, what he's trying to say is, I'm so grateful for that. I promise you, God would rather be, you be honest and unleash on him than be some kind of poetic hypocrite saying, fine, he's big enough to handle your hurt. He's, he, he already knows it anyway, so cast your cares upon him. Lord, why couldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I know you could, but you didn't, God. What, where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen? I, I'm trying to trust you, but I'm finding it really difficult right now. That kind of honesty. What do you do when it's two o'clock in the morning and you feel like the world is closing in on you? Be vulnerable. Talk to your spiritual friends. Receive their love. We had a whole sermon on, um, a whole series on one another and bearing one another's burden. For some reason, for a lot of you, it's a lot easier to provide care than it is to receive care from others. Second, talk to your father honestly, from the heart. And look, let me just be super honest right now. Um, All these things I'm suggesting have been really hard for me to do, ironically, at a time when I need the most, you know? The depression makes the disciplines, all the good habits, the things that would actually help the depression harder to do, but it doesn't make them any less true. And so the third thing that we see Jesus do when you're feeling anxious is you talk to your feelings. This is something I'll keep coming back to. It may be my life message of 
of preaching to yourself. You talk back to your feelings. Yeah, you need to listen to your feelings. Your feelings aren't anything to be ashamed of. Don't let people tell you that your feelings are invalid. But, but, your feelings make lousy masters, okay? They're great indicators, wonderful servants, lousy masters. And I understand the sentiment behind the kind of advice where we say, hey, you know, follow your heart, trust your feelings, but that's not always good advice. If, if I were to always follow my feelings, I'd be in jail by two o'clock, you know? <laughs> Don't obey your feelings. You are not your feelings. Your feelings, while always real, always important, your feelings are not always true. And you know this because sometimes you worry about and obsess about things that never actually happen. Um, what you want to do is tell your feelings, you're not the boss of me. Uh, you talk to your feelings. You speak truth to your feelings. You preach to them. That's what Jesus did. Watch what he did here in verse 36. He says, Abba, Father, everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me. That's what I want, okay? But then I'm going to tell you my feelings. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And if it wasn't obvious, Jesus did not feel like suffering. He did not feel like being rejected or falsely accused or misunderstood or despised. I don't think he was saying, I want to pay the ultimate price for a crime I didn't commit. I want to be misunderstood. I want to be despised. And yet he speaks truth to his feelings. He says, not what I feel, but rather the perfect will of God. Speak to your feelings. Tell your feelings the truth. Whenever you start to feel like maybe God doesn't love me, it's time to put on your preaching shoes and preach right back. And you say, no, no, God is love. For God so loved the world. God so loved me that he gave his only son. He loves me beyond measure, not height nor depth nor principalities nor powers. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. And whenever you feel like I'm all alone and nobody cares, man, preach, preacher. Preach to yourself and say, no, my God will never leave me. He will never forsake me. God has given me a church full of people who love me. Whenever you start to worry about finances, oh my goodness, there's more month than there is money. You preach to yourself. You remind yourself, my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's a generous provider. Jaira, he is enough. He will meet all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Whenever you feel like I can't go on, you got to tell your feelings. No, I can do all things through Christ, the risen Savior who gives me strength. I am not a victim. I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. What did Jesus do with his anxiety? He talked to his friends, his spiritual support system. He talked to his father. He cried out to God and he talked to his feelings. I need to tell my feelings some days to get in line. Who's with me? I need to tell some of my feelings. They're not aligning with my faith. I'm, I'm, I'm going to manage my emotions. They're not going to manage me. Uh, you ain't the boss of me, feelings. Does this even work, by the way, to talk to your friends, talk to your father, talk to your feelings? Well, let's see. What did Jesus do? He stumbles into the garden, almost unable to stand under the weight of soul-crushing anxiety. He talked to his friends. He talked to his father. He talked to his feelings. And when the soldiers came to arrest him, when they beat him, when he faced this unjust trial and the humiliation of the cross, what did he do? He said, no man takes my life. I choose to lay it down. When he's hanging on the cross and his own creation is mocking him and spitting at him and God in the flesh has looked away, 
And he says, Father, please forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then he says, it is finished. I did what you sent me to do. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. And he gave his life. No one took it from him. How do you deal with anxiety? I didn't used to. But now I'm talking about it. With my family, with good Christian therapists, with elders, friends. It's hard when you're feeling this way, but I've been talking to God. And some conversations would make you blush. Pastor, really? Yeah, you're not the boss of me either. God can handle it. He invites it. I'm going to preach to my feelings, especially the lies embedded in my feelings. The, The best way to fight lies is with truth. I'm going to say the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells in me. I'm going to say, listen, feelings, God has given me everything I need to do, everything he's called me to do. Paul said in in a Roman prison, don't be anxious about anything. What, What word would you put in there that describes you? Don't be anxious about what? The virus. Is that too big to say? Don't be anxious about the future. Don't be anxious about the decisions your child is making or your marriage. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And watch this. The very same thing that Jesus experienced, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Those of you that need the peace of God this morning. Would you just stand to your feet right now? You might even be watching online. Come on, stand up in your living room. Stand up in your bedroom. Is it the peace of God that will guard you? It is the peace of God. It's not your peace. It's not the peace of the world. That means the world can't give it and the world can't take it away, okay? You understand that even when your soul feels overwhelmed with anxiety, There is no storm that God can't bring you through. There's no obstacle that God can't help you overcome. There's no enemy that our God cannot defeat. And there's no heartache that our God won't heal. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Get ready to sing, church. Our praise does spiritual battle. Do you believe that? It shatters darkness. It changes the atmosphere. When I say Jesus, even in a whisper, it breaks down walls. Praise is the weapon that conquers our anxiety. It silences the enemy. Let our praise rise. We do battle in the unseen world, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 